The captain sat alone on the porch of the lonely inn. As he watched the leaves fall, he reflected on everything that had happened to him since the journey had started years ago. He recalled the man he was when he had been given the mission, a vibrant, driven, and passionate man whose heart was fully alive. He had been given a task that filled his life with purpose and meaning every moment of the day. Many people had lived lives far longer than his and had barely achieved a modicum of all the things he had in one month of that prosperous journey. But now, it was all over. There would be no more deep conversations around campfires at night. There would be no more travels to the wild, untamed places. There would be no more fellowship, no more love, no more purpose, no more life. As he rocked in his chair with the pistols in his lap, a single thought crossed his mind. So that's who I used to be. I feel all that restlessness, that inquietude, that certain indescribable something common to old bachelors, which I cannot avoid thinking, proceeds from that void in our hearts. Whence it comes I know not, but certain it is that I never felt less like a hero than at the present moment. Meriwether Lewis, 1807 Virtuous Man, a podcast devoted to sharing the lives of men of history, fiction, and today, and the virtues they personify. In this season, we'll take an in-depth look at one of the most famous expeditions in American history, the Lewis and Clark Expedition. In each episode, we'll highlight key virtues exemplified by the core of discovery and give a truly unique perspective of this incredible American adventure. A virtue is a behavior one conforms to in order to achieve a moral and ethically principled life through action. A virtuous man is one who is well aware of how he falls short, yet chooses not to allow his flaws to define him as he seeks to better himself. Such men show that it is possible to overcome the things that keep us from achieving our destinies. Though each man is flawed and imperfect, it is in the lives of flawed men that we see the possibility for virtue in our own lives. In the conclusion of the Lewis and Clark expedition, we will see how all the virtues learned on the journey came together to see the core through on their voyage home. We will join them as they make one incredibly daring decision, engage the Indians in combat, revisit old friends, and say fond farewells. We will see what happened to the men upon their return. And most importantly, what man of today can learn from the journey that changed America forever. Quotes from the expedition journal entries are cited throughout this episode. For listener clarity and narrative coherence, some of these quotes have been revised. Welcome to Episode 5, The Return Journey. March 23rd, 1806. We accordingly distributed the baggage and directed the canoes to be launched and loaded for our departure. At 1 p.m., we bid a final adieu to Fort Clatsop. Meriwether Lewis The Corps had been gone for almost two years. They had spent 95% of their stock of trade goods, and their supplies were significantly less than when they had left Fort Mandan one year ago. But there were reasons to be optimistic. Instead of marching into the unknown, they now knew the route back and which tribes they could trade with. Along the way, they had placed in various locations caches of supplies that they had been unable to take over the mountains. Lewis would still be looking for and recording new discoveries he had missed on the way to the ocean. Most of all, they had a clear idea as to when they could expect to be home. Nonetheless there were still many hardships as they headed up the Columbia. Once again, they were going against the river's current. Only this time, they were in thin dugout canoes instead of a sturdy keelboat. When they encountered rapids and falls, they had to portage around them. The salmon were not expected to arrive for another month, and food was scarce. But of all these trials, the Indians proved to be the greatest problem. As they progressed, the Corps was once again in need of horses, 
The Chinooks charged prices that the captains deemed far too high. Of particular irritation to Lewis was the fact that the Indians had such an abundant amount of horses, but would not part with them without charging high prices. The captains had little choice. They were forced to trade items they previously would never have dreamt of giving up. Even with the trade going on, the Indians would still steal items whenever they could, no matter how small or insignificant. Whether a tent stake or a coat or a horse, nothing escaped their thievery. They even stole Lewis's faithful dog Seaman for a brief period, though he was eventually retrieved. It became so irritating that Lewis had to repeatedly threaten violent reprisal for theft when they encountered Indians. This irritation even extended to his men. In one incident, Private Alexander Willard's horse wandered off due to negligence. Lewis reprimanded him in a manner that even he admitted was far more harsh than necessary. It was the first time anything like it had happened on the expedition. By late April 1806, Lewis's irritation gradually dissolved into anger, which further dissolved into a frightening resolve to do great damage to the Chinooks if he caught them stealing. In passages that are extremely out of character for Lewis, he expressed his rage in his journal. It was not my wish to treat them with severity, provided they would leave my property alone. They have vexed me in such a manner, by such repeated acts of villainy, that I am quite disposed to treat them with every severity. I would shoot the first of them that attempted to steal an article from us. We were not afraid to fight them. I had it in my power, at that moment, to kill them all, and to set fire to their houses. Lewis came very close to acting on these threats. On April 22nd, the Chinooks stole a saddle and a robe. Gathering a small posse, he ordered them to search the village. Lewis himself marched to the village behind them, determined to order the torches lit if the items were not recovered. Fortunately, they were found before he arrived. Similar to their encounter with the Sioux a year earlier, it was another example of potentially violent escalation between the Corps and the tribes being narrowly avoided. Had Lewis carried out the destruction, his reputation, and future trade with the Indians of the Pacific Northwest could have been ruined beyond repair. When the time came to travel by horse, Lewis did not order the canoes to simply be abandoned for the Chinooks to retrieve later. He ordered them burned, making it clear just how strong his opinion was of this particular tribe. Mercifully, such harsh responses and negative words could not be said of the next tribe they encountered. In the next few days, the Corps made contact with the Walla Walla tribe, who were neighbors and relatives of the Nez Perce. The men traded for horses and supplies, and there was much dancing and partying. The chief also informed them of a shortcut that would save them 80 miles. Surprisingly, the Indians returned items the men lost by accident instead of stealing them. By the time they left, they were equipped with over 20 strong horses and important information about the route ahead. In remarkable contrast to the Chinooks, Lewis expressed his feelings about the Walla Walla. I think we can justly affirm to the honor of these people that they are the most hospitable, honest, and sincere people that we have met with on our voyage. After a miserable two-day march along the shortcut trail, the Corps made contact once again with the Nez Perce. Before they left their village the previous year, they had made an agreement with Chief Twisted Hair to keep some of their horses, saddles, and various goods for the march back over the mountains on their return. Unbeknownst to the Corps, there had been a dispute of ownership between Twisted Hair and another chief, Cut Nose. When the two chiefs began arguing fiercely, the captains had no idea what was going on and became very concerned. They had enjoyed good relations with the Nez Perce before, and they began to worry if this was now crumbling before their eyes. To the captain's relief, the arguing finally died down, and they learned through Drouillard's interpretation what had happened. Cut Nose led them to the horses, which had been moved to his village. He offered them additional horses for food, and refused any payment. The corps stayed among the Nez Perce while they patiently waited for the snow to melt on the bitter roots. Due to a significantly lowered stock of trade goods, the Corps instead offered medical assistance. The Nez Perce were delighted, 
Clark had used his medicinal skills on them the previous year, and they had spoken very highly of his abilities while the Corps was trapped at Fort Clatsop. May 5th, 1806. These two cures have raised my reputation and given those natives an exalted opinion of my skills as a physician. I have already received many applications. They will not give us any provisions without compensation in merchandise, and our stock is now reduced to a mere handful. We take care to give them no article which can possibly injure them, and in many cases can administer and give such medicine and surgical aid as will effectively restore them in simple cases. William Clark The Corps supplied medicines in exchange for food, an arrangement which proved to work extremely well. Clark even set up a steam bath. This involved pouring water on stones heated over a fire inside a small hut. The patient stayed inside for 20 minutes, then plunged himself into the icy river, went back into the steam hut, and repeated the process. This proved to be highly successful in healing the Indians and the Corps members. Some of them, who had been unable to walk, even managed to recover. In addition to the trading, the two groups also engaged in games. The Americans were superior in shooting tournaments, while the Indians completely dominated when it came to horsemanship. The Nez Perce had more horses than any tribe on the continent. Lewis remarked that it was not unusual to see an individual Indian in possession of 50 or 60 horses. Like many tribes of the plains, they were masters of the horse, and their skills astonished the Corps. These games, tournaments, and shows of skill were not only essential for strengthening the bond between the groups, but it kept the men from the kind of slothful idleness that happens when soldiers have nothing to do. Once again, the Corps and the Indians displayed great kindness and generosity toward one another. It was a process that had repeated itself throughout the expedition. Time and time again, the various Indian tribes could have turned away this small group of strangers for any number of reasons. Yet they could see that they were not only from a mighty nation proclaiming peace and partnership, but that they could be allies, learn from them, and befriend them. It was now June. The Corps had been given a total of 65 horses, and Lewis had engaged in more botanical, zoological, and ethnographic studies. Lewis even obtained a specimen of what became known as Lewis's woodpecker, which went on to become the only surviving animal specimen of the expedition. After patiently waiting for over a month, the snow appeared to have melted enough for safe passage. After one more party, the Corps set off on June 10th. Despite the high spirits and the joy to finally be moving, Clark noted that he was nervous. Even now I shudder with the expectation of great difficulties in passing those mountains. From the depths of the snow, the want of grass sufficient to subsist our horses, as about four days we shall be on the top of the mountain, which we have every reason to believe is covered with snow the greater part of the year. It was another example of Lewis acting on impulse instead of sound judgment. He had set off too early without a guide into territory that the Indians had told him was cut off by snow. When they had last crossed these mountains, it had been in the fall. Now it was spring, when the snow was at its height. Lewis's cocky belief that he could do anything the Indians could do, and the burning desire to get back, led him to make decisions that he would not have dared to make a year earlier. There is no denying that the return journey had changed Lewis for the worse. Lewis himself was forced to acknowledge that he had made a mistake. As the Indians had warned, the snow had made further travel impassable. For the first time, the Corps was forced to turn around. Swallowing his pride, Lewis sent Druilliard and Shannon back to the Nez Perce to hire guides. They were willing to pay for them with rifles and horses, two things the captains were always reluctant to use for payment. After a few days, the men returned with three guides. Over the next six days, the Corps traversed 156 miles through the mountains. After escaping the snow, they arrived at what is modern-day Lolo Hot Springs. The party enjoyed a much-needed rest, and Lewis humbly proclaimed in multiple journal entries how pleased he was by the guides. As had been the case with old Toby, the Corps would no doubt have perished without the knowledge and expertise of these three Nez Perce men 
none of whom had reached the age of 20. So impressed was Lewis with the guides that he confessed his belief that not even the great George Drouillard could have found his way through these mountains. These fellows are the most admirable pilots, a race of hardy, strong, active, athletic men of good character and much respected by their nation. After the Corps made it to the place known as Traveler's Rest, they prepared for one of the boldest endeavors of the Lewis and Clark expedition. From here, the band of brothers would divide into two separate groups. Lewis and Clark had agreed on this division earlier. Clark planned to go down the Jefferson to Three Forks, and from there to the Yellowstone Valley. Lewis would travel toward the Great Falls and explore the Marias River with the hope of finding its source. Clark's route would cover almost a thousand miles, while Lewis's route was close to 800. Both groups would then be further divided into smaller subgroups of three or four to go on ahead and make further explorations. All of them planned to meet up gradually as they drew closer to the Missouri River. It was a complex plan that clearly showed three of the Corps of Discovery's greatest strengths. Their supreme self-confidence, the captain's trust in their men and one another, and their willingness to take risks for the sake of the mission. Though it was bold and brave, it was also incredibly dangerous. Lewis was planning to engage with the Blackfeet Nation, who were known for their great power. On July 3, 1806, with the separate parties organized and all the arrangements made, Lewis and Clark looked each other in the eye, shook hands, and set off. The greatest partnership in American history was once again dividing for another time, each going into unknown territory without the other. Neither man knew if he would ever see the other again. We collected our horses, and after breakfast, I took my leave of Captain Lewis and the Indians. At 8 a.m., I set out with Interpreter and his wife and child with 50 horses. William Clark. All arrangements are now completed for carrying into effect the several schemes we had planned for execution upon our return. We saddled our horses and set out. I took leave of my worthy friend and companion, Captain Clark, and the party that accompanied him. I could not avoid feeling much concern on the occasion, although I hoped the separation was only momentary. I proceeded down Clark's River seven miles with my party of nine men and five Indians. Meriwether Lewis Despite the emotional parting, Lewis and his party seemed to be in good spirits. In less than a week, they had emerged into good hunting grounds and regularly had plenty of food. In one case, Lewis noted that he saw what looked like 10,000 buffalo spread out over two miles. They arrived at one of the caches they had left at the site of the 1805 portage, and were very distressed to see that none of the scientific specimens had survived. To make matters worse, a band of Indians had stolen seven of their horses and were too far ahead for a pursuit. Despite these terrible blows, Lewis was still determined to explore the Marias River. The men managed to find the portage carts and canoes they had hidden near present-day Great Falls in Montana. With the added help of horses to pull the carts, the portage that had once taken an entire month was now accomplished in eight days. After making camp, Lewis decided to leave a small group behind and take Drouillard and the Field brothers with him to explore the Marias. With these plans in place, they departed on July 16th. The small group made their way north. The abundant wildlife and spectacular Montana scenery was no doubt a welcome sight to the men. Lewis frequently made poetic descriptions of the land in his characteristic style. Nonetheless, he was still concerned. He had originally planned to make contact with the Blackfeet Indians, who had a fearsome reputation among their neighbors, including the Nez Perce. But now that he only had a small band of three men, Lewis simply wanted to explore the Marias and go back without encountering any Indians, if possible. In addition to these worries, they were again facing their old enemy, mosquitoes. July 15th, 1806. The mosquitoes continue to infest us in such a manner that we can scarcely exist. My dog even howls with the torture he experiences from them. This is the last time Seaman is mentioned in the journals. His ultimate fate remains unknown, 
though there is good evidence that the extraordinary dog survived the expedition to the very end. Not only had he been invaluable on hunting excursions, protected the Corps members from wildlife, and even saved a few from drowning at various points, he had been a companion to Lewis ever since he floated the keelboat to St. Louis from Pittsburgh in 1803. There is little doubt that Seaman brought the young captain much needed comfort when his troubles threatened to overwhelm him. In late July, Lewis encountered a group of Blackfeet. They outnumbered Lewis by two to one. He had no way of knowing if these braves were part of a larger group, and their horses were in much better shape. Lewis nervously approached them like he had with other tribes in the past. He demonstrated that he was coming in peace, that he belonged to a mighty nation, and that he desired to bring them into the American Empire. To Lewis's relief, the Blackfeet invited them to talk further that night over pipes and a campfire. As they talked, Lewis unfortunately made a diplomatic error. In explaining what he was doing, he mentioned that he had been enacting the same negotiations with enemy tribes of the Blackfeet. If such dealings persisted, they would no longer have the power they were currently enjoying. After their talk, the men took night watches and fell asleep. At the crack of dawn on July 27th, Lewis was startled awake by the sounds of shouting. Drawing his pistol, he emerged to see Drulliard tugging his rifle back and forth with an Indian. When the Indian pulled it free and started to run, Lewis threatened to shoot. The Indian stopped and laid the rifle down slowly. The Field brothers explained that the Indians had attempted to steal all of their rifles and that they had tried to take them back. One of the brothers had even stabbed an Indian in the heart to get his rifle back. When the Indians began rounding up the men's horses, Lewis ordered pursuit. Lewis himself chased an Indian to the edge of a cliff. When it became clear that there was no reasoning to be done, he fired his rifle. The Blackfoot shot at Lewis before falling dead. It had been so close that Lewis claimed that he had felt the wind of the bullet passing. After retrieving their horses, the men burned the remaining Indian articles at the campsite. Lewis left one of the peace medals on the body of the dead Indian to let the rest of the Blackfeet know who they were. Knowing that the Indians would immediately launch a raid on them the moment they heard about the killings, Lewis, Drulliard, and the Field Brothers left in a hurry. Going at a pace of eight miles an hour, they fled throughout the day and into the night, only stopping to eat and to rest their horses. By the next day, they had covered a hundred miles. Remarkably, it was the only incident of violence between the Corps and the Indians during the entire expedition. Author and historian Larry Morris. And of course, this was the only time that uh, violence broke out between members of the expedition and Indians. And that was really a, a mistake on Lewis's part to be in such a uh, fragile situation. William Clark would have made sure that uh, at least probably two of those men stayed awake all night taking care of their arms so that nothing like that could happen. Even though they did have this uh, violence that took place and, and there were those two bl Blackfeet men that were killed, that subsequent developments in the Blackfeet nation indicate that that wasn't really the cause of uh, hostility among the Blackfeet. What they were really worried about was uh, Lewis and Clark and the Europeans who followed damaging their uh, trade. And really that threat, especially the threat of uh, Indian neighbors gaining more guns, really seriously affected the uh, Blackfeet relationship with uh, white explorers and white trappers. And that was also true of other uh, nations. The possibility that the uh, European explorers and trappers were going to completely disrupt Indian trade was one of the main reasons that uh, Indians became very wary of Western expansion. After regrouping with the other men, they continued to put as much distance between themselves and the Blackfeet as possible. On July 28th, Lewis was relieved to unite with Sergeant John Ordway's group, who had disbanded from Clark earlier on the 13th and had been traveling upriver. 
As July gave way to August, they continued to cover many miles with the hope of catching up to Clark. When they made it to the mouth of the Yellowstone, they found a note from Clark, which further drove the men to keep moving. While out on a hunting excursion, Lewis was shot through the buttocks. The bullet missed bone and passed through the outside of his hip. He blamed the one-eyed boatman Pierre Crusat, who had been hunting farther behind Lewis. Crusat vehemently swore that he did not shoot the captain, despite the fact that the bullet was not from a rifle any Indian could have owned. Though he was not fully convinced, Lewis accepted that it was an accident. His wound was dressed and he was laid on the floor of one of the canoes. The following day on August 12th, they reunited with Clark. Clark was initially deeply concerned for his dear friend, but was relieved to see that it had not been more serious. When Lewis had healed enough, the captains informed one another of their journeys. Clark's had been relatively uneventful. Sacagawea had once again proved to be invaluable, as she had known the best and safest routes along the trail. Clark noted that she, quote, had been of great service to me as a pilot through this country, end quote. The group had moved along swiftly, sometimes covering almost 200 miles in a week's time. On July 25th, Clark carved his name and date on a large rock mesa that he named Pompey's Tower, after Sacagawea's son. It is known as Pompey's Pillar today, and Clark's markings remain to this day the only surviving inscription carved on the landscape by the Corps of Discovery. The most notable incident occurred when a party of Crow Indians stole half of their horses, which forced the men to build canoes. The most valuable result of Clark's journey was the details added to his map, though he had failed to meet any Indians and recruit them into the American Empire. After regrouping, the men made plans to continue to the Mandan villages, which were not far off. On the evening of August 12th, Lewis wrote in his journal, At 1 p.m., I overtook Captain Clark and party and had the pleasure of finding them all well. As writing in my present situation is extremely painful to me, I shall desist until I recover and leave my friend Captain Clark the continuation of our journal. However, I must notice a singular cherry, which is found on the Missouri in the bottom lands about the Beaver Bends and some little distance below the White Earth River. After this brief botanical description, Meriwether Lewis's contribution to the journals of Lewis and Clark was over. Two days later, the Corps of Discovery arrived at the Mandan villages. There were warm words, tears of joy, embraces, smoking, and celebrating. The chiefs were especially glad to see the captains, though they had bad news. The fighting between them, the Sioux, Arikaras, and Hidatsas was still ongoing, and the Mandans refused to send one of the chiefs back to Washington. It was yet another example of Lewis and Clark's naivete on Indian affairs, and how the expedition's Indian policy had failed to change much of anything. It was only through heavy bargaining that Chief Big White agreed to go back with them. Before departing, the captains gave permission for Private John Coulter to leave the expedition and join a party of trappers heading back to the Yellowstone. Coulter had been one of the expedition's best hunters, and the captains clearly thought highly of him to allow him to end his military service early. They also settled with Charbonneau for his services. He and Sacagawea stayed with the Mandans, though before the Corps left, Clark made the couple a promising offer. I offered to take his little son, a beautiful, promising child who was 19 months old, to which both him and wife were willing, provided the child had been weaned. They observed that in one year, the boy would be sufficiently old to leave his mother, and he would then take him to me if I would be so friendly as to raise the child for him in such a manner as I thought proper, to which I agreed. After leaving the Mandans, the Corps finally entered the home stretch. They were back on the mighty Missouri, and they were now going with the current and unburdened by the bulky keelboat. They managed to cover 70 miles a day, no doubt looking on the shore at familiar landmarks and laughing at old memories. At one point, they stopped by an island in the river that they had camped at two years before. Clark noted that, quote, At this island, we brought two years together. End quote. The men stopped at the grave of Charles Floyd to pay their respects to the only casualty of the Lewis and Clark expedition, 
The hill is now known as Floyd's Bluff, and a monument stands a hundred feet high on the site today. They began to encounter American traders and trappers who gave them pieces of news from home. Jefferson had been re-elected, and while Lewis and Clark were at the ocean, he had commissioned the Pike Expedition, Red River Expedition, and an expedition to discover the source of the Mississippi River. These were all intended to explore and map other parts of the Louisiana Purchase, though none were nearly as successful as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. The men learned that Alexander Hamilton had been killed in a duel with Aaron Burr, and that two Indians had been hanged for murdering a white man. General James Wilkinson was now governor of the Louisiana Territory and had dispatched troops to engage with Spanish forces. These trappers and traders did not, of course, have any news about their friends and family. The Corps was now determined to get home as quickly as possible. Our party appears extremely anxious to get on, and every day appears to produce new anxieties in them to get to their country and friends. My worthy friend, Captain Lewis, has entirely recovered. His wounds are healed up and can walk and even run nearly as well as ever he could. William Clark On September 23, 1806, six months to the day upon leaving Fort Clatsop, the Corps of Discovery arrived in St. Louis. After a round trip of over 8,000 miles and being gone for 863 days, the greatest journey in American history was finally at an end. Author and historian Ellen Woodger. Some would say that the expedition's greatest legacy is that it opened the way to the country's expansion across the continent. But the fact is that would have happened even without Lewis and Clark. By the time of their return in 1806, fur trappers, traders, and mountain men had already started moving westward. And of course, it was the mountain men who opened up routes to the Pacific that would eventually complete the country's expansion, not Lewis and Clark. But the expedition really did play an important role in that expansion all the same. Uh, there was their scientific documentation of plants, animals, and native peoples, which added significantly to American knowledge of this vast territory. And what they recorded continues to educate us today. Their maps and their descriptions of the country and the terrains they explored made a considerable difference to those who came after them and brought contemporary understanding of the uh, continent to a new level. Uh, in the 864 days since they had left St. Louis, only one man, Charles Floyd, had died, probably from appendicitis, meaning that even the best medical treatment of the day could not have saved him. Compiling one of the best records on natural history ever produced, covering and describing 178 plant and 122 animal species previously unknown, they made significant contact with at least 15 Indian nations, including some who had never seen white men before, treating the Indians with respect, detailed records of American Indian culture and language. They kept meticulous records of their position and the surrounding geography, constructing a map of the region between St. Louis and the Pacific that was surprisingly accurate. For the next half century, explorations from William Ashley to John C. Fremont, from Wilson Price Hunt to Kit Carson, and from Provost to Jim Bridger those journeys were all unmistakably influenced by the Lewis and Clark expedition. Clark ended the journals of Lewis and Clark on September 26th with six words. A fine morning, we commenced writing. As people in St. Louis saw the Corps, they fired their guns and hollered cheers. Everywhere they went, they were overwhelmed with questions about all they had seen. Parties were thrown for the Corps in nearly every town they visited, and word of their journey spread by word of mouth like a wildfire. Aside from Jefferson, they had long been given up for dead by their countrymen. It was a joyous moment of triumph few of the men would ever forget. After taking room and board, Lewis wrote to the President. St. Louis, September 23rd, 1806. Sir, it is with pleasure that I announce to you the safe arrival of myself and party at 12 o'clock today. In obedience to your orders, we have penetrated the continent of North America to the Pacific Ocean. 
and sufficiently explored the interior of the country to affirm with confidence that we have discovered the most practical route by the navigable branches of the Missouri and Columbia Rivers. If the government will only aid, even in a very limited manner, the enterprise of her citizens, I am fully convinced that we shall shortly derive the benefits of the most lucrative trade from this source, and that in the course of 10 or 12 years, a tour across the continent by the route mentioned will be undertaken by individuals with as little concern as a voyage across the Atlantic is at present. The anxiety which I feel in returning once more to the bosom of my friends is a sufficient guarantee that no time will be unnecessarily expended in this quarter. I am very anxious to learn the state of my friends, and particularly whether my mother is yet living. I am, with every sentiment of esteem, your obedient and very humble servant, Captain Meriwether Lewis. Though Lewis had the unfortunate task of telling Jefferson that an all-water route through the continent did not exist, the overwhelming abundance of discoveries and plans for a continental fur trade independent of the British would no doubt make up for the loss. Jefferson received the letter in mid-October and promptly wrote a now famous reply. Washington, October 20th, 1806. I received, my dear sir, with unspeakable joy, your letter announcing the return of yourself, Captain Clark, and your party in good health to St. Louis. The unknown scenes in which you were engaged and the length of time without hearing of you had begun to be felt awfully. In addition to his report, Lewis took great pains to praise the men individually for their accomplishments. He also reminded Jefferson that Clark may have been a lieutenant, but due to his invaluable services as co-leader, he was every bit an equal to Lewis and deserved the same rewards as himself. He also made sure the men received any possible advances on their compensation for services rendered, whether healing diseases and wounds on the frontier or assuring their payments in St. Louis. Lewis's attentiveness to his men knew no bounds. When they had finally settled their affairs in St. Louis, the captains, some members of the Corps, and a few Indian chiefs made their way to Washington. Once again, parties were held and speeches given. During these public addresses, Lewis humbly made a point to praise his worthy friend Clark and the men of the Corps. They arrived on December 28, 1806, and Lewis reunited with Jefferson after three and a half years of absence. Sadly, there is no record of how the meeting went. One can imagine a tearful embrace and joyful laughter as they strode into Monticello to pour over maps and writings. Jefferson must have responded with a childlike wonder, hungry for the next story, the next description, the next possibility. For a man as learned as Jefferson, a man who could never receive enough knowledge, it was a truly unforgettable moment to be talking with his friend about all he had seen. With the visit to Washington complete, the men received their bounties. The captains received 1,600 acres of land, the Corps members received 320 acres, and all received double pay. Upon receiving their rewards, the small band of brothers who had conquered a continent together quietly went their separate ways and faded into history. Some of the men are believed to have died of complications from syphilis contracted from their excessive fornicating with the Indian women. After reconnecting with his parents, Sergeant John Ordway got married and moved to Missouri to farm the land he had been given. He purchased the land deeds of several corps members, which, in addition to his own, left him with 1,000 acres. After losing everything in the New Madrid earthquakes of 1812, he spent his remaining years in poverty. George Drulliard joined a fur trading company with a few other Corps members when he discovered he was too restless for life as a farmer. He was tried for murder in one notable incident, though the charge was dropped. He eventually went to work for the fur trade near Yellowstone and died in 1810. John Newman, who had been sent back to St. Louis for talk of mutiny in the spring of 1805, became a trapper and was killed by the Yankton Sioux in 1838. John Coulter rose to the status of an American legend when he not only became the first known mountain man, 
but the first man of European descent to enter a place known as Coulter's Hell. We know it today as Yellowstone, the first national park in the world. Joseph Whitehouse joined the army for the War of 1812, but deserted in 1816 and drifted into obscurity. Alexander Willard eventually emigrated to California in his 60s, lured by the promise of gold. George Shannon, who had been the youngest member of the Corps, was elected to the Kentucky House of Representatives in the 1820s. He also became a U.S. District Attorney through the appointment of President Andrew Jackson and died at the age of 51. Patrick Gass was the first to publish his journals, in which the term Corps Discovery was first found. He lost an eye in the War of 1812 and worked under the leadership of a famous man named Daniel Boone. He married for the first time at age 60 and had seven children. Remarkably, at age 90, he volunteered for the Union when the Civil War began. He passed away in 1870 at the age of 99 as the last survivor of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Sadly, York did not receive any compensation for his service. Not only was he the first black man to cross the American continent, he had also participated in every trial and hardship on the voyage. He had been invaluable in hunting, looking after the men, and developing good relations with the Indians, who revered and respected him greatly. Out in the wild, he was an explorer as free, equal, and capable as any other man. Back in St. Louis, he was once again nothing more than a slave. The owners of York's wife had moved to Mississippi, and it was likely York never saw her again. Clark finally granted him his freedom ten years later. He also gave him a wagon and horses to help him get a start in the freighting business in Tennessee and Kentucky. Historical records are sparse, but some accounts suggest that York may have died trying to return to Clark, that he became a Crow Indian chief, or that he died of cholera 20 years after gaining his richly deserved freedom. Sacagawea visited St. Louis in 1809 and gave birth to a girl, whom she named Lizette. In addition to her close relationship with Clark, she remained very attached to white people and maintained her quiet, calm, and gentle demeanor. In an 1806 letter to Charbonneau, Clark referred to Sacagawea as Your woman who accompanied you on that long, dangerous, and fatiguing route to the Pacific Ocean and back deserved a greater reward for her attention and services on that route than we had in our power to give her. After going back home to the frontier, she became seriously ill and died at the age of 25. As with her son, Clark became legal guardian of her daughter. Sacagawea would become the most famous and revered expedition member after the captains, with numerous memorials, monuments, stamps, and minted coins created in her honor. To this day, there are more statues of Sacagawea than any other woman in American history. True to his word, Clark raised Sacagawea's son, John Baptiste. He was sent to him at age six, three years after he had made the offer to Sacagawea. Jean Baptiste, the first infant and child to cross the American continent, became a mountain man and scout and died in Oregon at the age of 61. In 1808, Clark moved to St. Louis and became the chief Indian agent for the territory of Upper Louisiana. Though he was ultimately acting in the best interests of the American Empire, Clark was also appalled by the mistreatment of Indians and worked to preserve their culture and heritage. Lewis and Clark made every effort to maintain good relations with all the native groups they encountered and largely succeeded, but they and they continually promised long-term government protection in exchange for peaceful trading practices. This laid the groundwork for American dominance over trade in the West, which in turn diminished British and French influence and gave strength to the American economy. So much so that in later years, the idea of manifest destiny took hold in the American imagination. You know, the belief that the United States was destined to extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The story of the Lewis and Clark expedition helped to fuel that belief, and unfortunately, it ultimately led to the subjugation of the Indians to whom Lewis and Clark had promised protection. And it also led to almost complete eradication of the Indian way of life by the late 19th century. This is a very sad legacy, because the expedition, after all, had a peaceful mission. 
Lewis and Clark returned to St. Louis in the fall of 1806. And in the spring of 1807, the uh, trapping really got serious. So you have the immediate effect of the expedition was all these trappers going west. Uh, the fur trade uh, could be very beneficial to the uh, Indians and certainly they benefited from it. And I believe uh, many of the trappers that I've investigated like uh, Jedediah Smith, John Coulter, Thomas Fitzpatrick, uh, they really tried their best to treat Indians respectfully the same way that Lewis and Clark had done. But even Lewis and Clark who were following uh, Jefferson's instructions, he, uh, he really stressed good treatment of the Indian nations that they encountered. Jefferson, of course, did it in the context of believing that uh, European culture was superior to Indian culture. And, and part of the uh, maybe unintentional effect of that is the eventual destruction of uh, Indian culture. Uh, Je Jefferson, for example, wanted the Indians to be farmers. They, they did some farming, of course, some of them did, but uh, hunting and uh, war were two key elements of Indian culture. Europeans wanted the Indians to change their culture. They did not want the Indians to have wars among themselves because that would interfere with what the uh, Europeans were trying to accomplish. The military naturally came west, and of course, Lewis and Clark were, were military. And, and one thing that really uh, disturbs me is that the American government would uh, make a treaty in good faith with the Indians. And then with so many migrants going west, eventually that agreement wouldn't look uh, like it worked anymore. There were so many people coming west and trespassing on Indian land that the United States, to me, it's just kind of unbelievable that they would deal with the situation by essentially coercing the Indians into signing a new treaty that gave away more land, rather than sticking by the terms of, of the treaty. They should have made every effort to do that, rather than just uh, renegotiating. And uh, at, at some points, the Indians felt like they had no recourse other than uh, fighting for their land, because bit by bit, more and more land was taken. Lewis and Clark were part of the generation that believed the European culture was superior. There's no doubt about that. And we can criticize that, but I think they did their best uh, to treat the Indians respectfully. Whereas that a number of people that followed, I wouldn't say that was true. Along with his chief duty as an Indian diplomat, Clark was also promoted to the rank of Brigadier General and eventually Lieutenant Governor of the Missouri Territory by President James Madison. He married his long-standing love interest, Julia Hancock, with whom he had five children. In a poignant ode to his beloved friend, he named his firstborn son Meriwether Lewis Clark. Upon Julia's death, Clark remarried in 1820 and had three more children. He died on September 1st, 1838, at the age of 69, in the home of the son who was named after the captain with whom he had conquered a continent. Lewis received the great honor of being elected to the American Philosophical Society and was also appointed the governor of the Louisiana Territory. Tragically, despite having everything in the world going for him, Lewis would not prosper or succeed in the same way as his friend Clark. In Washington, there was much political infighting over whether the journals were government property or the personal property of the individual writers. The sometimes nasty fights were largely about royalties and rights, and Lewis and other core members were thrown directly into the conflict. Remarkably, Lewis did not write a single word of the anxiously awaited version of the journals intended for publication. This, along with his struggles in the mind-numbing role of governor, caused rifts to form between him and Jefferson. He had expressed in letters to friends a deep longing to be married, yet despite numerous attempts at courtship, no woman would marry him. Clark himself once recommended a promising young woman, but like all the others, it came to nothing. The weight of his celebrity status, overwhelming responsibilities, failures of duty, and being turned down by every woman he longed for 
plunged him back into the alcoholism of his youth. He began drugging himself with opium and morphine. Debts began to mount. His bouts of depression and melancholia began to grow more frequent. There were large lapses of time where Lewis did little to nothing worthy of note. He often did not reply to letters. Jefferson's term was over, and he could no longer provide the same level of political support. Everything Lewis had known and loved on the expedition was gone. He no longer had a loyal platoon of frontiersmen who would follow him to the gates of hell if necessary. He no longer had a close friend by his side. He no longer had the mentor and father figure he had come to rely on so heavily. He did not have a wife with whom he could share his new life. It was a recipe for disaster. In September 1809, Lewis made his way by boat to Philadelphia to clear his name regarding some financial discrepancies and to finally begin the long-awaited publishing process. Clark, whose friendship with Lewis had remained as strong as ever, noted his dear friend's mood after he departed. I have not spent such a day as yesterday for many years. I took my leave of Governor Lewis, who set out to Philadelphia to write our book. Several of his bills have been protested and his creditors are all flocking in near the time of his setting out, distressed him much, which he expressed to me in such terms as to cause empathy. I do not believe there was ever a more honest man in Louisiana, nor one who had pure motives than Governor Lewis. If his mind had been at ease, I should have parted cheerfully. While traveling on the Missouri River, Lewis wrote his will, in which he left everything to his beloved mother, Lucy Marks. He tried to kill himself twice on the journey, but failed when he was restrained by the crew. His behavior and drunkenness had become so erratic that he was placed on a 24-hour watch. One of the commanders went so far as to describe Lewis as being, quote, in a state of mental derangement, end quote. He gradually improved over the next week, but it did not last long. Lewis arrived at a lodge known as Grinder's Inn and took up room and board on October 11th, 1809. The innkeeper, Priscilla Grinder, noted that Lewis would pace frantically, inside and outside, smoke pipe after pipe, and, quote, talk to himself in a violent manner like a lawyer, end quote. After all this, he sat down, faced west, and told Mrs. Grinder that this was a very pleasant evening. A few hours later, he took out two pistols and shot himself in the head and chest. He was only 35 years old. I fear this report has too much truth. I fear that the weight of his mind has overcome him. I heard of the certainty of the death of Governor Lewis, which gives us much uneasiness. William Clark Governor Lewis had, from early life, been subject to hypochondriac affections. This was probably increased by the habit into which he had fallen and the painful reflections that would necessarily produce in a mind like his. At about three o'clock, on the night of October the 11th, he did the deed which plunged his friends into affliction and deprived his country of one of her most valued citizens. Thomas Jefferson. With Lewis gone, the publication of the journals seemed in doubt. Thankfully, Clark found a publisher, and the work was finally published shortly before the War of 1812. The importance of everything the expedition accomplished would not become fully known until the end of the 19th century with a new publication of the journals. Before this new edition, many of their discoveries for science were not correctly attributed to them. Ever since, the Lewis and Clark expedition has become firmly acknowledged as one of the greatest achievements in American history. Like Columbus, Cook, and Magellan, Lewis and Clark took their rightful place in the pantheon of world explorers. Whenever I think of the Lewis and Clark expedition, what continues to amaze me is how such a diverse group of men, along with a solitary Indian woman and a young boy, came together as a unit to cross a continent and return without any conflict or loss of life except for Charles Floyd. Lewis and Clark themselves were completely different personalities, but they complemented each other and they worked together well. 
They also brought innovations to organizing and leading the expedition that were revolutionary at the time. For starters, they put together a group of men who brought different talents and skills to the expedition. They needed men who could work together as a unit, but could also act independently and intelligently when necessary in a hostile and unknown environment. Their success in this regard is evident in the overall success of the expedition and in the stories of the contributions so many individuals made to that success. Another innovation was their use of democracy on the expedition, which was extraordinary for a military mission. There was the election to choose a new sergeant after Floyd died of a ruptured appendix, and that was an election in which even Lewis's slave, York, was allowed to vote. And then in November 1805, there was the vote that was held to decide where to build Fort Clatsop. All of this and more are tributes to Lewis and Clark's skills as leaders. They demonstrated that to maintain unity and harmony and to get the best out of their men, especially in an unknown land with unexpected dangers constantly hanging over them, it was necessary to bend to the accepted rules and trust their men to do the right thing, just as their men had to trust them. So I believe this trust to be not only their greatest legacy, but also their greatest virtue. Discipline, teamwork, unity, loyalty, risk, perseverance, posterity, bravery, sacrifice, passion, courage, friendship, brotherhood, love. Nearly every virtue known to mankind was enacted during this dangerous, wondrous journey nearly 220 years ago. In looking at this great adventure, one can clearly see how often it would have failed without the virtues this small group of men displayed. So many crucial moments in the expedition depended on just one or a few men choosing to act virtuously. And more often than not, they did. Of the over 40 Indian tribes the Corps encountered, an overwhelming majority of them chose friendship over hostility. They could have easily refused or even killed the small group for any number of reasons. Had they done this, history itself would have been changed forever. Yet instead, they chose to help them, feed them, shelter them, and learn from them. It is clear that without the Indians' hospitality, generosity, and compassion, the expedition would have failed. The members of the Corps of Discovery began the journey as individuals and ended as a brotherhood who loved one another like family. They came together from all walks of life to share in a mission, not for personal gain or glory, but for the unspoken needs that lie within all men. A man's restless need to explore, to forsake a comfortable and easy life, and to play a valuable role in something greater than himself. And at the head of this band of brothers rest the two captains whose names are forever linked in the minds of their countrymen. Like many great men, Lewis and Clark were full of contradictions. At times their flaws got in the way and made things more difficult. They could be needlessly reckless and impulsive. In regards to spreading peace to the tribes, they were naive and ignorant. They would sometimes say they believed in an ideal and then act in direct opposition to that ideal. Yet these flaws never prevented them from losing sight of their purpose. They pressed on toward the goal and ultimately completed the task laid before them. They were both very different men who were more than capable of doing well on their own but together they knew they could achieve greatness. They were not just leaders, but servants. Time and time again, the men's well-being and the expedition's goals came above their own personal desires. Together, Lewis and Clark were everything that a leader should be. Together, they gave their country a hope and a future. Together, they show men today how they can live lives of greatness, adventure, and above all, virtue. This episode of Virtuous Man was written and recorded by Scott Einig and edited by Jamie Adams. Featuring the voice talents of Larry Einig as Thomas Jefferson, Ethan Thomas as Meriwether Lewis, and Jared Thomas as William Clark. Special thanks to Larry Morris, author of The Fate of the Corps and In the Wake of Lewis and Clark, and Alan Woodger, 
author of Encyclopedia of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Tune in next time for another episode of Loose and Unscripted, where we discuss the making of Season 4.